hello and welcome to Surgery Secrets, where we go behind the scenes to uncover secrets about surgery you won't hear in the classroom. My name is Isabel and today we are sitting down with Dr. Mike Dijkstra. Let's get started. So first we'll begin with some quick fire kind of short answer questions. Um, so can you tell us your name? Sure, uh, so I'm Mark Dijkstra. And what is your occupation? I'm a general and colorectal surgeon at the University Hospital in Edmonton. And what does your job entail? Uh, so I have an elective colorectal practice, which involves uh, surgical oncology for colon and rectal cancer, as well as a benign practice, which includes inflammatory bowel disease. And then I also do some uh, anal rectal uh, surgery. Uh, so those are the surgeries I do. And then also I do colonoscopies and then a clinic, so pre-op, post-op. So that's my elective practice. And then for my emergency or on-call practice, I do acute care general surgery. So I do uh, several weeks a year and a bunch of nights a year of, of being on call for that. And can you tell us your favorite color? Uh, red. Uh, and what is your favorite food? Uh, I like the five color vermicelli bowls at the Vietnamese restaurants around here. <laughs> um, and what is your favorite superhero? Uh, Deadpool. And your favorite musical artist? Uh, I'm a big country fan, so I like Eric Church, Luke Combs, Chris Stapleton are probably my top three right now. And what would be your favorite movie? Uh, Deadpool 2. We watched that the night before a Royal College exam, so <laughs> stress reliever. Um, and can you tell us your favorite organ of the body? Uh, I, the cecum, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> um, can you tell us the last book you read? Uh, Searching for Alaska by John Green. Mm -hmm. And can you recommend me a TV show? Um, yeah, I would, I would just recently watch the uh, Drive to Survive documentary on Netflix about Formula One racing, which I thought was pretty interesting. Nice. Okay, so you passed the quick fire round, so we'll kind of get into our nitty gritty questions. Um, can you tell us who your biggest influence was career-wise? Yeah, I don't know if I had one person who was kind of my biggest influence, but I think throughout training, both in undergrad and then in medical school and uh, residency and then fellowship, there have been numerous people who um, you could tell they cared about about their their students or their residents, and they encouraged you, encouraged me. Um, not all of them were like warm and fuzzy encouragement. There's some demanding <laughs> encouragement, but I think there's the people who you know, we're looking out for your best interests, who want you to do well. And uh, it's kind of those people who are in your mind still, and you, you hear their voices when you're operating or when you're doing stuff, reminding you to do certain things, like find the right tissue plane or mm -hmm. do certain things to the needle or, or those kind of things. So I'd say a, a variety of people throughout. Uh, no no one person's kind of been my, my number one mentor. Mm -hmm. um, so you mentioned kind of people in your training. Um, do you have a most memorable moment from your training? I think the, the moment I found out I passed my exam, I uh, was definitely, I guess that was when my training officially ended. So that was, that was extremely memorable. I'll never forget that morning when I, when they posted the exam results. Um, I think there's been a couple kind of more clinical memories of um, certain traumas or certain um, patients we had or dealt with. The ones I think that stick out are sometimes unfortunately the ones that stick out are the, the bad outcomes, but also, um, patients who are admitted for a long time and then eventually get better and get to go home. And that's always really rewarding and memorable when you've worked with a patient for weeks or even months and then you get to see them get discharged home. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So do you have like a specific recent memorable moment that, that you can think of? Um, recently, well, we had, I had a patient on call a couple of weeks ago who came in with a perforated gastric ulcer, which is a, a terrifying, um, for me, at least, a terrifying situation I have to do with on call because it's not too colorectal in nature, but it's something that we often get uh, mock oral exams and, and we talk through a ton, but it's the first one I'd seen alone in practice. And so uh, I had recently done one with a colleague a few days before, so it's nice to have recently seen uh, a stomach surgery and now having to do it on my own uh, for the first time was definitely memorable. Mm -hmm. And they did, did well so far, so that's good. <laughs> that's good. Um, so like every day you go in and you do these surgeries or you deal with patients and lots of people outside the medical world can't 
put themselves in your shoes and, and understand what that's like. Is there anything kind of specific that people outside of medicine just don't understand about your job? Uh, I think a question we get quite a bit is people don't understand the difference. Like we're not emergency room physicians, we're often in emergency room seeing patients and decide if they need surgery. So they'll say, oh, I was, I was in emergency last night. They're like, oh, are you an emergency room doctor? I'm like, no, I'm a surgeon, but we go to emergency labs. That's one thing. The other thing is for colorectal surgery, everyone assumes it stinks like, like stool. Uh, and th it does sometimes, but I think the most of the time it doesn't because we, we often give people bowel preps and we're not trying to get into the colon. We're trying to stay out of the colon and just resect it. So it doesn't stink like, like poop too much. Mm -hmm. And another thing would be, uh, it seems like on TV shows when you're operating and you like do one tiny slip, the patient instantly dies. And thankfully that's not the case. Patients don't die super quickly or mistakes or small errors you make in surgery aren't often uh, catastrophic instantly um so yeah those are a couple of things well that's good <laughs> those are good <laughs> that i made and didn't nice. know <laughs> um can you tell us what the absolute best part of your job would be uh, i love operating so if we have a good elective operating day and, and there you know like we play music in the background and the case is going well and there's a resident or a medical student who's really engaged and fun to work with there and everyone's relaxed and having a good time and it's, it's really fun to, to operate. What song do you normally put on when you operate? Uh, I put on the country music <laughs> playlist, much to the chagrin of most of the residents. <laughs> but I'm, yeah, I like it, so <laughs> I've been picking. I guess on the other side of that, what would you say is the worst part of your job? Uh, I think, well, paperwork, mm -hmm. doing like filling out forms and finishing charts and stuff isn't fun. Uh, complications, if, if we do surgery and things don't go well and, and dealing with complications is is really stressful um it's hard not to take that home with you sometimes uh, and then also when we have patients who come in and we're assessing to see if they can have surgery especially for colon cancer sometimes they're unresectable and so to tell them we can't help them and they're they're not curable and they have to go to palliative care and that that can be difficult too mm -hmm. um i've asked this question to lots of surgeons now and and the most popular answer has been paperwork. Yeah, and no one likes the paperwork. <laughs> not at all. Um, so I guess in your practice, can you tell us about maybe like the weirdest or grossest thing that's ever happened to you at work? Yeah, we had, it's interesting. It's funny because I thought about it the other day, there's, I did residency in the same place where I now work. Mm -hmm. uh, and so a lot of memories are often tied to locations. So I remember a certain bed in the ICU and when I was on my ICU rotation where we had a patient who came in, I forget even what their their problem was initially, but they were being kind of rolled, they were intubated, so they weren't conscious. And so they, would, they were being rolled on their side uh, to get their dressings changed and their, their backside changed. And the patient just had explosive diarrhea like all over the nurse who had rolled them over, which is definitely the grossest thing I saw. And then that same patient, um, the patient's wife came to visit at the same time as his girlfriend came to visit and they didn't know that the other one uh, existed. And so then they got in a big fight and we shortly had to call security. So that whole patient, the whole corner of the ICU uh, is very memorable every time I walk by. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> that pretty funny. That's pretty crazy. Oh my goodness. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> so this is kind of funny because the the next question I'm going to ask you is about your support system. And I'm just thinking about this specific patient support system and how right. <laughs> they didn't know about because the other. Yeah. Um, yeah. But you tell us, yeah, about your support system and what they, they mean to you. Yeah, I think from, I say this is true of a lot of the, my colleagues and people I've talked to. So I have kind of a, a medical support system of, of colleagues uh, and then a non-medical support system. And I think, both are kind of important because it's nice to get away from medicine and just hang out with people who don't know you as you know clinically and you can just kind of forget about medicine and, and hang out with them so i have a good group of friends uh, i went to high school here in edmonton and so i have a big group of high school friends who i hang out with still um so that's nice and then my family obviously no one in my family is medical but they're a big support group um and they kind of know a lot more about the medical side just from me going through it uh, and then on the medical side, uh, I'm really lucky to have a couple great, well, more than a couple, but a bunch of great colleagues uh, who I can bounce ideas off of and make sure I'm not doing anything crazy. I'm still pretty new. I just finished my first year in practice. So 
being able to run things by them and make sure I'm not doing dumb things and kind of figuring out how the system works and, and that kind of stuff is awesome. And then the co-residents I did my chief year with uh, and took my exams with and studied with are awesome because uh, we went through residency together and we studied together. And so I often call them for advice and we chat about difficult cases and what we would do uh, and that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. So when you were at school, so even before medical school, did you ever imagine yourself living your current life? No. So I remember distinctly, we, I was talking with my cousin who was one year older than me and we were in high school and we were talking about like what we we're going to do when high school was done. And we were talking about like accounting or engineering and then we were like, ah, medicine would be interesting. And we both said, no, it was like way too much, way too much school for that. Um, so I, I wasn't planning on it. In, like it was in the back of my mind in high school. Uh, but I thought oh, that's a lot of school, so I wasn't too interested. And then in undergrad, I took a lot of science courses, and I was like, okay, this is this is really interesting. This is something I want to do. But then in medical school, I was like, well, medicine's cool, but surgery, I don't know if I want to do the, like long five year residency. It seems tough. And then I really, really like my surgery rotation. And so I'm like, I guess surgery is the one. But then I was like, but I'm not going to do a fellowship or a master's because I don't want to do all that extra stuff for an academic position. And then as I went through, um, residency is like well I like the academic position and I kind of want to do co-director fellowship so I ended up doing the master's and the fellowship and the residency and everything so no I didn't imagine that and then being fortunate enough to get a job back in Edmonton where where I did my training and where I grew up um, you know it's like a, a dream come true so I didn't expect this um, mm -hmm. I'm very happy and, and lucky mm -hmm. um, so if you weren't doing your current job what career do you think you'd most like to do I think if I could like choose to be talented, I would want to do something like be a professional skier, professional mountain biker, or, or something outdoors hiker. Mm -hmm. um, I, if I didn't have like professional caliber skill, I think something like park ranger or something yeah. outside for sure. Mm -hmm. yeah. Cool. A basketball coach, I don't know. Like <laughs> so we're kind of on to our last question here. Um, if you could go back, what advice would you give your younger self or someone considering your career? Uh, I think I would say like don't be scared off by the length of training um, kind of like I talked about I, I never thought I would do any of the things I've done but as you go through you kind of realize if that's what you want or if that's what's interesting the work it's challenging but it's not it's not uh, such a big barrier that you can't do it so don't be scared off um, also I'd say don't be scared off by people who appear to have it all together and seem way smarter to know everything and and be ahead of you because I think a lot of people in medicine they talk about like imposter syndrome where you don't feel like you measure up to your colleagues but I think most of us do I think the selection process to get to where we are is weeds out the people who actually shouldn't be there and everyone knows who's left is qualified so don't be don't be scared by your awesome colleagues just be happy like happy they're there to help you get through uh, and then I find there's a lot of pressure in medical school to figure out what specialty you want to do uh, and I know I was always stressed out by that when I went through. And so I think there's a tendency for people to see an awesome preceptor and assume they want to do that specialty, even though it might just be because they have such a, a, a great preceptor and the actual medical specialty might not be great for, for them. And then on the flip side, you have a terrible preceptor. And so you think that specialty is terrible, but it's actually a great fit for you. It's just hard to separate the preceptor from the what you'll clinically end up doing. So I think trying to really, as a medical student, take a step back and say, do I really like this rotation because I have an unbelievable preceptor or do I really like this rotation because I actually like the, the medicine we're doing? Or the other way around, do I dislike this rotation because of the preceptor or because of the actual clinical work? And I mean, in a perfect world, you have a great preceptor in the, in the rotation you're on and then it, it becomes easy, but it can be hard. Mm -hmm. and then I guess the other thing would be, in medicine, we tend to really be really good trash talking other specialties. Uh, so don't put too much stock into what other people say about your specialty or the one you, you're interested in. Like you talk to anybody about surgery and they'll give you a lot of negative feedback who's not in surgery. But by the same token, I can give you a ton of negative feedback about other specialties. So again, don't put too much stock in what other people say, but do listen to people who are in the specialty because they obviously know it best and have been through the training and can give you advice about what to expect and, and how life after residency is way better, way worse, or about the same as, as life during residency, which which is important because residency is tough but temporary, but uh, the lifestyle after is what 
you're really going for. So that's what you have to kind of decide if you can can handle or if that's what you want to do. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Dykstra, for joining us today on Surgery Secrets. It was a pleasure to have you join our series. Thank you. And there you have it. Join us next time for another exclusive look into surgery today. Follow us on LinkedIn for new Surgery Secrets episodes and check us out on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. For more information on Surgery 101, head to our website, surgery101.org. Thanks again, and we'll see you next time.